66. 6640. Your future lies in 6640. 66 books by 40 authors, and yet we now discover it's an integrated message system from outside our time domain. Welcome to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher is Chuck Missler, connecting the Bible to your life and the world around you. In today's study, Chuck begins his teaching on Halloween, Session 2, Witchcraft and the Occult. We're going to talk tonight about which witch is which. <laughs> or in other words, we're going to talk a little bit about witchcraft and the occult. And since we're here at the Telestai Christian Center, and I'm sure you know that the pastor is Randolph Michelson, his wife is Joanna Michelson, famous for written a number of outstanding books, one of which is The Beautiful Side of Evil and so forth. But one of, the, one of her many, many gifts uh, is her quip for puns. <laughs> I know of no one that's more skilled with puns than Joanna. And one of my favorite favorites of her one-liners is, have you ever found a happy medium? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so stealing that line of hers, that could be a subtitle for what we want to talk about tonight a little bit. We're doing a little series on Halloween. It's interesting that once a year, we as a culture face this peculiar holiday. And on the one hand, we are immersed in our culture with all kinds of pagan vestiges, the names of our weeks and virtually all the major holidays. Upon uh, research, you'll unravel the fact that almost all of them go back at least to Rome and some of its rituals. Certainly most of them even go back to Babylon and so forth. And so there are many of them may trouble the serious Christian, but none more than the peculiar holiday that we, some, we, we sort of dismiss in a childish way, uh, Halloween. And yet, the more we think about it, the more we explore it, the more sinister it becomes. It is not just a casual thing to shrug off uh, casually. It is, in fact, a very, very serious holiday. And uh, as Pat Matriciana has uh, so so, uh, colorfully pointed out, for a Christian to celebrate Halloween is like asking a Holocaust survivor to celebrate Hitler's birthday. In fact, by the way, Pat at the Las Vale conference did an interesting thing. He opened up the conference discussing this conversation he had with John F. Kennedy. And he was, of course, being facetious and, 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 and doing a parody of our first lady's conversation with Eleanor Roosevelt. So he was, of course, just kidding. But it's interesting that in seriousness, neo-paganism, the new age, call it what you will, is now politically correct. In fact, federally enforced in our schools. And so we discover, we'll discover more and more the occult in its various shapes and sizes and various forms is becoming increasingly promoted in our society. Even in our popular entertainments, we find Ghost Dad with Bill Cosby. We find Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Ghostbusters and other, other forms of entertainment with a light touch indeed and yet uh, promoting the, this whole uh, um, area. Now, there are, of course, if you've traveled at all, at all, you know there are psychic hotlines being promoted everywhere, 900 numbers and so forth, and I think uh, Dave Hunt and others would even put the Myers Clinics in that category as close cousins. The area of the occult is real, it's active, it's malevolent, and it's out to do you harm. And one of the things I hope you'll take away from this evening's discussion is the reality that these things are not to be dismissed as colorful pastimes and not to be dismissed as casual games. They are serious. They are the result of deceptions by very powerful, sentient beings whose skill and weaponry is primarily in the realm of deceit, deception. And uh, so it makes it increasingly difficult. Now, this whole idea of witchcraft is a bizarre subject in our day to many. And yet we find, if I, uh, from the polls and so forth, there are more witches today in England and America than there ever has been before since the Refor- Reformation. Time magazine's estimated that there are at least 160,000 practicing witches in America, about half that many in Britain, and that's probably a gross underestimate. The United States is believed to harbor the fastest-growing and most highly organized body of Satanists and occultists in the entire world. Now, when we speak of the occult, this 
term can embrace a broad collection of things, including mediums. And the more popular term today for the same thing are channelers, clairvoyants, psychics, spiritists, diviners, mystics, gurus, shamans, psychical researchers, yogis, uh, psychic and holistic healers, astral travel, astrology, mysticism, Ouija boards, tarot cards, contact with the dead, UFOs, we'll talk a little more about that, and thousands of other practices which virtually defy cataloging. They include Satanism, astrology, the Kabbalah, Gnosticism, theosophy, witchcraft, and many forms of what would be called serious magic. And uh, includes um, activities seeking the acquisition of hidden things, things which are expressly forbidden by God in the Bible. And when you look at look for these things and look for the list, don't overlook the pulpits of the churches in America, because it includes the doctrines that Paul warned Timothy about. Turn to First Timothy chapter four. Let's remind ourselves of First Timothy chapter four, verse one. Paul, in counseling his young protege, said, "Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly." That in the latter times, when is that? It's a synonym for the latter days, the end times, and so forth. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And it goes on, giving some examples. Doctrines of demons, strange idea. We often think of doctrines as maybe ill-considered, doctrines that are emerged from the, the less than fully informed. No, it's much more serious than that. You've got doctrines of demons which are uh, knowingly, consciously engineered, tailored, designed to deceive. As some of you know, my partner and I were the guys that brought Walter Martin from Wayne, New Jersey to the West Coast with his Christian Research Institute. Walter and I were good friends. I was on his board for many years. Walter estimated that over 100 million Americans were actively or peripherally involved in these areas. And that may have been, again, an underestimate. A recent University of Chicago national poll revealed that 67% of Americans now profess a belief in the supernatural. And 42% of these believe that they have been in contact with someone who died. Now, another way to do this, rather than bore you with more statistics from publications and so forth, go to any secular bookstore and do a windage guess at how much of the floor space is relegated to the New Age or the occultic areas, in contrast to how much floor space is given to religion as a topic or Christianity as a topic. It's become very, very obvious that the occult and the New Age, these materials are bigger than any other religious interest. And don't fault the stores. Their job is to be responsive to consumer demand. What they have determined is that's where the demand is. That's where the interest is, by a factor of probably eight to one. Now also, as you I think are also aware, but let me just remind you that the occult is also behind more grisly crimes than we generally care to imagine. And uh, I think most of us may remember the episode of Charlie Manson and the bloody mess in the murder of Sharon Tate. I have a particular interest in that because I can remember being asked to meet with Sue Atkins who was his girlfriend when she was obviously she was arrested she was in solitary confinement out in Chino and she asked to see me because she had heard the tapes I should point out to you that um, she was a follower of Anton LaVey the head of the Church of Satan up in Hidashbury and all that and he, she was of course part of the, the Manson family as they called themselves and uh, she was one of the groupies whatever you want to call it that uh, was arrested as part of that whole Sharon Tate mess And uh, she did come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she wrote a book called Child of Satan, Child of God. And since uh, she had heard some of my tapes, she asked to see me. And I'll never forget that. Naturally, when I had this opportunity, I quickly got a copy of her book and did a little homework just to, so I, you know, be up to speed on this. And on the book, they had a picture of her when she was arrested, a frail, gaunt, haggard, tragic-looking figure. Uh, When I was able to meet with her in Chino, I remember being startled at the physical difference. Here was a gal that was petite, attractive, fresh, crisp, clean-looking gal. I was prepared for a change because she had come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I was startled to realize how pervasive 
that appeared to be in that encounter. But ask any police officer that you may have uh, access to uh, intimately about what really goes on in these metropolitan areas. Ask them about covens. Ask them about stolen, the frequency of stolen animals or stolen children. In fact, there's a major traffic in stolen children for use in satanic ritual. And so uh, these things are, are heavy, they're serious. And this, this is not limited to the lunatic fringe. Some of us probably dismiss this as, well, that's part of a large culture that we have these strange creeps at the fringes of our society. No, it's become a commanding presence of almost irresistible persuasion throughout our society. In one form or another, almost everyone in our culture will sooner or later be exposed to the dangerous entanglements of the occult in one shape or another. The, word, the English word occult comes from the Latin occultus, which means to cover up, hide, or conceal. The purpose of the occult, in whatever form you want to frame it, is to deceive. Now, it is not simply a philosophy or a pastime. It is the domain of very powerful, sentient, hostile super beings who have a vigorous agenda to destroy you personally. That's their agenda. There were many false concepts in ancient Israel. If you were a member of the nation Israel, wandering through the wilderness in the days of Moses, and you had the belief that the earth was flat, what was the consequence of that? Probably nothing. With a little imagination, I could probably make a list of superstitions that you might believe that about which the Bible is silent. It doesn't attempt to deal with every conceivable weird idea you might have picked up by some misconception about reality. And yet, if you were caught doing a horoscope, if you were caught doing the equivalent of what is in our culture a Ouija board or tarot cards, what was the result? death. Those techniques, those practices, those rituals were a capital crime, not because Moses had some weird thing in his craw, because God commanded it. Why? Why would God emphasize, call their attention to the gravity of these strange, childish pastimes? Because they're dangerous. They're dangerous. Not just weird superstitions. They are what's called entries. Now, the reality of the spirit world is no longer ignored or denied by secular science. There's been a number of projects uh, throughout the recent decades uh, which have made parapsychology, or call it by other labels, apparently a legitimate field of research. J.B. Ryan, funded heavily by the Xerox Corporation and others, has formed the parapsychology lab at Duke University. And there's other equivalent kinds of institutions around the world. And uh, they promote the notion that psychic powers are natural abilities in all or some people. That's sort of the general view of the uh, parapsychology literature, that some people seem to be gifted with certain gifts, certain abilities. This itself is one of the occultic delusions. And um, one of the things that uh, will, if you get into the research and do the homework, you'll discover that people who exhibit these kind of skills are getting assistance from the dark side, if I can use that as a figure of speech. Let me make reference to one item that I have a little bit of experience with, and that is how many of you have seen the movie The Exorcist? Remember that some time ago. Uh, in those days, I was on a board with Walter Martin, and Walter Martin set out to debunk that. He was offended by the movie because the movie sort of, in a sense, had Satan win. And so he was very upset about that, and he did some homework on William Blatty, the author of the book that, from which they made the movie. And he was startled to discover that this guy was legitimate. This guy had done his homework. The novel, obviously fictional, was drafted largely from a series of case studies, in fact, one particular one, in New Jersey. It happened to be a boy, not a girl, as was featured in the novel and used in the movie. But much, not all, but much of what was portrayed in that rather bizarre movie was taken from actual case study experience. I'm also reminded of a bizarre event that we had 
Uh, Walter, in those days, would come to the West Coast. He was based in Wayne, New Jersey. The Christian Research Institute was in Wayne, New Jersey in those days. But we used to book Walter in the West Coast. And Walter's style was to be to come out to the West Coast for like maybe two weeks. And we'd do a Sunday night at some church, followed by a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, three or four night thing on some topic. Uh, his famous book, The Kingdom of the Cults, was, is still a classic to this day. And often much of his presentations were having to do with the uh, deviant pseudo-Christian groups, groups that call themselves Christian that really aren't. But this particular trip, he'd planned to, uh, what he'd do, he'd do this typically two churches. Uh, typically, uh, one of the, the venues would be uh, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach for a few nights. And then he, typically some other church, and, and Verl Inley in those days, running uh, Granada Heights Friends Church, would be also a comfortable venue for Walter to do a, a, a series. And we used to tape Walter in those days for albums of tapes for him, for his own benefit, and for his ministry. And we had done a series called Kingdom of the Cults, the packaging matching the book that was so famous at that time that he did. He's done, it's still a classic, sort of a, a white book with orange and black uh, uh, accents. Well, he decided he wanted to do a series called The Kingdom of the Occult. So we had revisioned black albums with real deliberately spooky kind of covers. And so he, did, he, he wanted we, to accumulate the tapes, the eight tapes for the, for the uh, uh, series. Uh, he did a series of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. And he opened Sunday night with a general presentation on the occult, somewhat of the flavor we're dealing with tonight. But he dramatized or got the audience's attention by opening his presentation with a detailed discussion of a demon possession experience in New Jersey that he drew upon to dramatize to the audience the reality of these things today. When you think of demon possession, you think of the book of Acts or something or the Gospels. No, it happens today. And he went through all of this. It was quite dramatic. Well, an interesting thing occurred that Sunday night. Walter, having just traveled from Wayne, New Jersey, out there, it was, he was on East Coast time. By the time we were through with the questions and answers and stuff, it was 10 or 11 o'clock, but it was like 2 a.m. his time. And I was trying to get Walter free of the crowd to go to the Newport Inn and crash and get some rest. And a friend of mine had with him a uh, couple, man and wife, and their psychiatrist, and Larry came up to me and says, they, these people have to talk to Walter. And I says, Larry, let's be gracious. Walter is exhausted. Let's schedule it sometime while he's out here, but not tonight. Larry says, trust me, he's got to see them. And Walter agreed to do that. He says, let's not do it here. Let's, let's meet me in my room at room 137, Newport Inn, down the coast a little bit from where we were. Okay. So they drive over to the Newport Inn, and as they pull into the parking slot, it happened the car that, that had the visitors from Long, from Long Beach in the car next to them. And Walter turned to Larry and said, says, let's pray. Walter somehow sensed something was up. When he got out of the car, the gal, the wife, didn't want to get out of the car. And Walter says, they won't let you, will they? And that got everybody's attention. Walter somehow sensed what was going on here. Well, I won't go through the whole details, but the net of it is, is that um, the psychiatrist, who was originally not, a, I don't believe, a believer, a denominationally uh, at, at best, the husband and a handful of men, spent most of the night holding this gal down while they had a classic Old Testament exorcism. Strange voices, strange experiences. Before it was all over, she was delivered, praise God. I met the couple a year later, and the husband said uh, he's got a whole new wife. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But it happened that the following Sunday night, we were recording the same series of messages at Granada Heights Friends Church. And Walter gets up there and does the same message he, did, he had done at St. Andrews the previous week previous Sunday night, except <laughs> instead of talking about the guy in New Jersey, he recounted what happened at the New Porter Inn six days earlier at, uh, in room, I think it was 137 at the New, uh, New Porter Inn. And so if you can track down a, a, a copy of that uh, tape set, you will hear Walter recount in detail what happened at the New Porter Inn. Now these things are real. The other things that you'll encounter are these things called ghosts. That sounds like something out of literature, kind of a fiction. There's a whole body of literature about poltergeists. It's, it comes from a German word, polter meaning to make noise by throwing or tumbling around, and geist is their word for spirit or ghost. There are over a thousand books published in English this century alone, on poltergeists alone. Poltergeist activity occurs every day of the week. And we could go on and on about this. Most of us, most people read this, read it with a, a jaundiced eye, and maybe a lot of what you do read is a little bit of nonsensical. But let me tell you one thing that you people in this room were at least close to. You may recall that I used to come down to this church. I used to, uh, when I operated out of Big Bear, 
I used to have my Tuesday nights here, and I used to do Wednesday morning breakfast nearby, and then Wednesday night at Costa Mesa. That was my cycle. I came down from Big Bear, did my Tuesday night thing here, spent the night in Hal's home. I'd meet him in a study, and we'd wrap till 2 or 3 in the morning on various things. Then in the morning, I did a men's Bible study over at Marie Callender's nearby, and then headed down to Orange County and did my Costa Mesa thing Wednesday night, and then headed back to Big Bear. That was my cycle. Did that for some time here, and that's one reason this congregation is very dear to me, because you guys were, when I first started doing this full-time, you were one of the congregations that was behind me when, <laughs> when very few others were, and I appreciate that. But I have to tell you about an event. Uh, Hal had a guest, had a special guest room, and I normally, when I stayed at Hal's home, he had a very comfortable home, and he and Kim were very gracious to receive me, and I used to stay at this guest room. Uh, that was my little routine. I'd, after here, I'd, uh, at wrapping with you guys, I'd head up there, and, and typically Hal and I would have some cappuccino or something and just wrap one whatever was going on, and uh, that was, those were very precious days. But this one particular time that I was there, they were doing some remodeling, and the room that I was normally in was not available. Well, there was another room that was down the hall. Hal said, well, you can use the such and such room, and so that's fine. And, but as, they, as uh, I was getting ready to go to bed after three of this, Kim and Hal were looking at each other kind of strangely. And I was trying to pick up this, and Kim said to Hal, you're not going to tell him. And Hal was a little embarrassed because Hal had planned not to tell me just to see what would happen. <laughs> But after discussing it between the two of them, sort of as inside, Hal leveled with me. Because none of their guests had ever survived an evening in that room. His girls that sometimes stayed with him uh, after a night or two would not stay in that room. And he started telling me all these strange experiences. This particular room in his home seemed to be subject to strange goings-on. So much so that Hal confided to me that one night... He decided to sleep in this room. He woke up in the middle of the night, floating about a foot off the bed, and it scared the crap out of him. (laughs) So what they were going to do, apparently, Halzell thought was, let's just not tell Chuck and see what happens. (laughs) Hal's a neat guy, but he has a mischievous streak in him. Well, what Hal and I did is we kneeled by the bed in that room and prayed, bound the forces of darkness with prayer, and uh, candidly, nothing happened that night. It was uneventful. I think Hal and I were both kind of disappointed the next morning when I gave him a progress report. (laughs) They did discover that apparently the previous owner of that home used to have seances in that room. And uh, they, I believe since they have remodeled the room. They've torn off the wallpaper. They've virtually rebuilt the room and so forth. And I haven't, I, forget, I meant to call Hal and get an update before mentioning this on uh, something openly like this. But uh, I suspect that that's a thing of the past. However, it's interesting. There seems to be uh, both experiential and biblical basis that demons tend to be territorial. They're confined to certain geographies. We find that in Daniel 10, they're, 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 they're the super demons are in fact tied to certain empires and so forth but also from other experiences we get a sense at least as we research this area that for some strange reason demons tend to be tied to certain areas or certain history and I suggest that all of you if you own a home or living somewhere give some thought to walking the property line and exercise you do not know the spiritual history of that piece of real estate you don't know that It may have been way, way back in the past, the subject of ritual applications, and you may want to do that. Uh, I went down to Murrieta Hot Springs. As you know, Calvary Chapel has acquired the famed Murrieta Hot Springs, and they're refurbishing the whole place to be a conference center. And that's got an unusual history in its own sense. I mentioned to Chuck. I says, Chuck, have you uh, walked the property line? He knew what I meant. He turned to me and says, every day every day. So I share that with the thing. Now, when you start talking about these kinds of things, there are typically at least three theories regarding the occult. The medium, mediumistic theory is that poltergeists and such are somehow the roaming spirits of the dead. Now that's a widely held view by many authors and experts. It is non-biblical. 
That's one of the agendas of the demons is to promote that idea because the Bible clearly teaches that the spirits of the dead are confined to either heaven or hell. And there's a lot of scripture. I don't have to go through all of that. Matthew 25, Luke 16, 2 Peter 2, 9, and other, a lot of passages that nail that to the wall. So that's a fiction that is promoted by the dark side. A second uh, series of explanations are that, well, this is parapsychological that somehow this constitutes some kind of human phenomenon resulting from psychic or psychokinetic abilities. There's lots of literature in that area. And that is also uh, very close to the New Age related. And again, even uh, uh, scientists and so forth uh, discover there's things that are hard to explain without recourse to supernatural phenomenon. And uh, this is obviously, by the way, well refuted in biblically based uh, research. And, of course, the third explanation, and that is that these things are caused by demons. And uh, that leads to a whole study that I encourage you to go in depth. We won't be able to do that all tonight. But I encourage you to, uh, if if the Spirit leads you, to do some homework about the nature of demons. You've been listening to 6640, the ministry outreach of Koinonia House and Koinonia Institute. Today's Bible teacher was Chuck Missler, teaching on the dilemma of Halloween. Download the new K-House TV app to access an ever-growing collection of free resources. Visit the Apple or Android App Store or search K-House TV on your Roku or Fire TV streaming device. Thank you for listening to 6640 and for your continued prayerful support of this ministry. Until next time, as we continue this series, may God bless you with the knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ, as you study His Word.